Right, I would now like to hand over to James Hick, who is going to chair the next session on workforce sustainability. I'm absolutely delighted to be here today to discuss this critical session. And we have some exceptionally knowledgeable uh, industry experts joining us to discuss the issues, to give some insights and solutions to the challenges that we face in regards to our equestrian workforce. So we have Ben Mitchell Winter, BHS Stage 3 Coach in Complete Horsemanship and General Manager of Littlebourne Equestrian Centre. Ali Window, Manager of, Little, of um, Owner and Proprietor of Mount Maskell Stables. L Lucy Catan, who's the Executive Director of the British Grooms Association and the Equestrian Employers uh, Association. Linda Greening, Head of Diversity at Harper University. And Zoe Elliott, Head of Careers, Marketing and Recruitment, British Horse Racing Authority. Perhaps just for speed, Ben and Ali, if I could perhaps just invite you to come and take a seat um, just up here on the stage. And of course, we would very much like audience participation, and I hope, time permitting, that we'll have a chance for lots of questions. When we think of uh, workforce and the sustainability of it, what do we actually mean? Well, the question we might ask ourselves is, do we have a sustainable workforce across the equine sector in all roles and all levels of ability to allow us to thrive now and in the future? And when we think of the workforce, we must also consider our incredibly important asset, of course, which is our horses. They're an intrinsic part of our workforce. But however, today, we'll really focus on people. And we're not alone when we worry about access to talent in its widest sense. You only need to think of the shortages of HGV drivers, doctors, nurses, care workers, equine vets, and so the list goes on. The UK faces an unprecedented talent shortage post-Brexit and following the pandemic. We refer this to this as the equine workforce talent crunch, perhaps like no other we have seen in our recent history. And the equine industry is unique because of the need for our horses, as I mentioned. I'd suggest that we're going to have to think differently and re-engineer our expectations from the ways that we have traditionally thought. If we're going to re uh, retain and attract the suitable talent that we need in our workforce. Before I go on, I could just ask for a Slido question. Just take a moment to consider where was the first place that you learned to ride? Everybody's getting busily back out on the Slido. So I can't see if our timer is running down. Jan, are we? Yeah, about 20 to 30 seconds. 20 to 30 seconds. My local riding school. So around 80% of us are local riding schools. Let's just hold that thought as we go through the rest of the conversation. The positive news is that post-pandemic, more people are looking to start or return to riding than ever before. Many riding schools are reporting they have long client waiting lists. The not so good news is they cannot find the qualified staff or access the number of suitable or affordable horses required to meet the ever-increasing demand. In a recent insight survey carried out across 170 employers, we learned that more than 50% of vacancies advertised in the last 12 months actually went unfilled with an average salary of around £24,000. So when we consider that these jobs are critical to running a successful equestrian business, the situation really looks very concerning. Some of the reasons these businesses were coming up short on candidates was the lack of applicants, candidates not having industry experience, the need to work long and inflexible hours, working weekends, insufficient pay, and an acute shortage of qualified staff. So what do the workforce want? So we asked 160 people working in the sector 
what they were looking for in an employer. And they told us that they were looking for personal development, control of their hours, employment benefits, and freelance work. Fundamentally, working for a good employer was the most important thing, with a work-life balance often being more coveted than higher earnings. So it seems that we have a talent mismatch in what employers are looking for and what the workforce is demanding. If we are to attract and retain employers within our sector, we're going to have to be creative, pull candidates from non-traditional talent sources, and consider how we respond to the needs and demands of today's changing workforce. What we know is a fact is that if we can attract young people or other non-traditional workers of all types to our sector, and we can retain them for at least 24 months, then they tend to remain in our sector for a long and prosperous career. Over the past two years, the British Horse Society has fundamentally transformed our approach to supporting riding schools and livery yards by providing more than £1.1 million in grants to help weather the pandemic and support businesses to bounce back. In addition to the approved centre scheme, has gone from one of setting standards to a far more holistic approach to offering dedicated business support and upholding standards. So today, I am really pleased to announce the next phase in our strategy to support both riding schools, livery yards, and those who want a professional career in our sector. We call this the BHS 2022 Career Transition Fund. It's a direct intervention for us to try and materially increase the number of BHS qualified coaches and grooms within our sector. The transition fund is specifically targeted at those who have completed their BHS stage one and open to all those who now want to progress to their stage two and three. The fund will be providing grants towards stages two and three and training will be provided by our accredited professional coaches and at any BHS approved riding centre. Applications for the fund will open on the 7th of March and I hope that we'll be able to attract hundreds more qualified coaches and grooms to our equestrian industry. Now, I would like to turn to our great uh, guest that we have here today. And the first question that I'd like to ask is to Ali Window, who's our proprietor and owner, Mount Maskell, as I said before, where you have 40 riding, riding school horses and 90 liveries. And we've got Ben Mitchell, winter stage three professional coach and complete horsemanship, general manager. I know you're working through stage four and, 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 and on stage five as well, Ben. You're a very, very busy guy. But let's get the, the, the uh, riding school and coach's perspective. So Ali, if I can ask you first of all, you're right at the very sharp end of running a very large and important riding school. Which skills are you finding the hardest to recruit, and how have you been able to overcome some of those challenges? Thank you, James, Your Royal Highness. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today about um, the pressures that riding school as a sector face with regards to employment. Um, when you ask about skills, for, from my personal experience, it's completely across the board. We, um, we cannot get instructors, yard team, grooms, riders, all are very hard to recruit. And the situation as I see it is pretty catastrophic. Um, I do have massive concerns about the future of riding schools. And to me, riding schools are the fabric of the sport. And it's, it shows where people learn to ride, entry level um, work, and then people can then go on to work. Where I'm in a situation now where retaining sufficient workers, high quality or not, is massively problematic and it's an escalating issue that will continue to exist unless we address this problem. Um, the talent pool appears to be very shallow and the demand for talent exceeds supply, which you've addressed. Um, 
the recruitment and retention, the pressures that we're currently facing um, is at critical level despite successful efforts to diversify and innovate my own business. We've been established for 54 years. I've been working in the business for 25 years. Um, the existence of my riding school is under threat because the day-to-day -day running um, physically, it, it falls on me. If I can't get the staff, then you know, I'm, I'm, I'm front facing and I, I'm, I'm mucking out, I'm teaching, I'm doing everything, doing the admin, I've got my health and safety hat on, my HR hat on. Um, it is a busy role. The workforce make the business possible and if you don't have the workforce, you have no business. And essentially, this is my message today that we really need to, I think riding schools are overlooked. I think we really need to get down to the nitty gritty on how we can train um, the, the next generation of um, employees to, to be skill savvy because skills are massively lacking. Um, from my experience, people coming into the industry um, at grassroots level, possibly college leavers, they're not work ready. Um, and then you have people who perhaps are qualified on paper and they're coming in to the business and um, sadly they do not have the skills um, to carry them through and so there are lots of lots of things to to add into the pot um, what I, what uh, I would say is that the, course, the course. demand for riding's there um, which essentially is is completely ironic because we can't facilitate that because we don't have the people there to teach so post pandemic you've got you know there's been an increase in the interest in the sport and in, and riding and that's fantastic, and we want that to continue. But if you haven't got the grassroots people in the arena teaching those up-downs, where do we go? So, and also, my motto is horsemanship for all. Um, my business, we're very community-led. Our, our reach is far and wide, and, um, you know, we're not... We like to challenge the concept that riding is an elitist sport only for the affluent, and with, I think, the change in the workforce um, where people want flexi hours and sadly, you know, they're demanding more money per hour, uh -huh. their freelance mentality. Um, how, as a business model, is it viable for us to sustain? Absolutely. You know? it, it, it's a critical issue, isn't it? And as we heard from our audience there, 80% of us learned to ride at a riding school. Yeah. Passioned and absolutely spot on view from us to share that. If I can turn to Ben, Ben, you've, you, you, you're a role model to so many people. You've taught hundreds and thousands of people, I'm sure, over your career. So tell us, how are we going to get more people like you coming into our sector, Ben? OK, thank you, James. Hi, Your Royal Highness. Um, so personally, really, today I'm here to talk about how we can try and encourage people or qualified staff and trying to retain them within our centres. Um, because at the moment, there's a lot of big, good, amazing training centres out there. Um, but when it comes to obviously getting to your BHSAI or your level three instructor, to go to that next level is a little bit harder. It's going to be quite costly in time and funds. Um, there's a lot of good training centres out there, but a lot of them are sort of on the intensive fee paying. So although I was working full time um, as a position as a manager, I couldn't quite afford to tap into that training, um, to go and train with some first-class people, you know, talent and stuff like that, just to mention a few. Um, so I was very grateful for the BHS um, because I had my level three of qualification. I was awarded the scholarship to train to my stage four. Um, and obviously growing up in London, in a local riding school, um, without that scholarship from the BHS, I wouldn't have been able to take my training to the next level um, and tap into that. So I sort of think we need to look at the qualified staff we've got and look at a way of trying to retain them within the UK centres. Um, I was successfully headhunted to go to the Middle East, uh, work for the world's biggest oil company, um, and I was there for four and a half years. Now, looking at the packages abroad to the packages in the UK, obviously facilities are different. We're not, you know, I'm not trying to tell everyone in the UK to have facilities like the Middle East, but the lifestyle is kind of different. Obviously, tax free salaries, uh, resort, um, question centres attached to hotels. So we want to try and 
make the UK and the British riding schools more appealing for our qualified staff to stay in our UK because we need to try and keep our homegrown talent here and try and train the new people coming up within our industry. You know, everyone has the dream of being an international rider, but it's the support team that we need to try and keep, retrain in our riding school. Absolutely smashing, Ben. And you resonates back to Robert Huey's points as well from fantastic training facilities, keeping our talent whenever, wherever that is, whether that be in England or in Northern Ireland or, or wherever. Thank you very much, thank Ben. You, That's really uh, great, great uh, inspiration to us all. I'm really delighted now to invite Lucy Catan to the stage. We heard that Lucy spoke to this forum 20 years ago now, and it's a great delight to hear you back, Lucy. And I'm sure you'll be as impassioned as you were 20 years ago now that you are uh, taking the stage again. Thank you very much. So many good photos of Ben. <laughs> Am I flicking? Yeah, okay. Okay, um, Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to share a view of what we see and, and are experiencing at the British Grooms Association and Equestrian Employers Association. In 30 days' time, from the 1st of April, the national living wage and the national minimum wage rises. The Low Pay Commission have already identified the equestrian industry as one of low pay. Every survey we do identifies that about 40% are paid below the legal minimum hourly rate. The HMRC have noted the equestrian industry as one of non-compliance, and there has been a targeted focus over the past three years from them. The Conservative Manifesto pledged that the national living wage will rise to £10.50 per hour on, in two years' time on the 1st of April. 2024. If you take the average groom like Georgina, who's 28 years old, she works a five and a half day week, 7.30 till 5.30, resulting in a 50 hour week. Her annual salary in 30 days time on the new rate of £9.50 per hour will increase by £1,534. If the manifesto pledge is upheld from today, her salary will have risen by £4,134 in just two years' time. Now imagine this calculation for a business with, say, five or six members of staff, or more. The EEA recently ran a survey to discover what the real impact of the rise would be to equestrian employers. Of the respondents, 15% paid higher than the national minimum wage or national living wage to their staff. However, of the remainder, 96% were worried about the impact of the rise will have on their business. 30% had not yet calculated the cost increase to their business. 85% have said they will have to consider increasing their livery fees. And 38% were concerned that their business will no longer be viable with the increase. 41% stated there would have to be changes to or the loss of staff from their workforce. And most worryingly, 71% have said that they don't think their business will cope with the further increases in two years' time. It should be noted that typically employers that take part in surveys are those that are performing best or at least better practices. Although some employers recognise the need for staff to have increased wages in line with the cost of living, the majority of comments described a real concern over the viability of their businesses. Some employers described difficulties with clients not fully understanding the financial challenges of running an equestrian establishment. And some reported that they had real concerns that their clients wouldn't be able to afford an increase in the cost of services, particularly livery charges. So how does an equestrian business afford the latest wage bill increase and remain viable? This is particularly concerning in the professional and competition yards who struggle to operate with efficiencies in regards to the working hours of the day. And my biggest concern is a potential rise of substandard, a substandard employment as a result, and in particular in cases of false self-employment. Most days I receive a phone call, such as the one from Jenny last week. She called the BGA as her 
employer had said that she needed to purchase groom liability insurance for herself. Jenny worked on an event yard since January 2018. She was told she was self-employed upon starting the job. She has no contract, works a six-day week, 7.30 till 5, never finishes on time. Her accommodation is charged at £130 per week. She gives her employer her hours that she's worked each week and then she's paid in cash. She's had no annual leave. With the overtime considered, we calculated she's owed in the region of £12,000 in unpaid wages. This is yet another case of false self-employment. The lack of awareness of employment status in our industry is alarming. Retention has always been a key issue in our industry. Working hands-on with horses for some will never be a forever career path. That's okay, and it's normal. When a member leaves us at the, at the BGA, we always ask why. Sometimes it's due to a natural change of career, or having children, or an injury. However, more often than not, it's due to their experience of poor employment practices that they choose to exit our industry, with false self-employment being the most common reason. To have a sustainable workforce, we as an industry, together, must ensure that good employment is the norm. Any parents in the room, ask yourself, are you confident that your son or daughter would be employed correctly if they chose to work with horses? At an event, are you confident that every horse box that parks up is a compliant employer? There are some excellent employers, and over the past 15 years, I genuinely do believe they have grown in number. Two of them are sat here today. Um, however, our research shows over and over again that it's currently not always the case, and we simply have to do better. At the EEA, we have created the Code of Good Employment to provide a framework to strengthen good practices and ensure that businesses are legal and well run. Fiona runs Kingsmead Riding School and Livery Yard. She's a signatory to our Code of Good Employment. She adheres to all the legal requirements. She pays correctly. And in addition to legal employment, she practices good management, which aids in the motivation and retention of her workforce. Staff will still come and go, but no member of the workforce has ever left due to poor employment. Imagine if this was the norm across our entire sector, how many grooms would be saved from leaving. 19 years ago, I spoke at this forum about the need for grooms to be recognised for the role that they perform. I believe that now, at the elite level of our sports, that grooms are recognised for their skill and professionalism. Certainly, our patron, Charlotte Dujardin, has made such an impact with her public applause of her groom, Alan Davis. However, it is disappointing, despite all of our hard work and my outspoken words, that nearly 20 years on, when we ran a survey just last week, yet again we have a figure of 47% of grooms that responded have not been given a written contract of employment. This invariably also means that they're likely to be missing out on many other basic employment rights. It must be noted that if a groom works in the racing or the riding school sector, that they are likely to be employed legally as thanks to those licensing systems, the good employment is more the norm. To create a contract is no longer a hurdle for an employer. The Equestrian Employers Association has a smart online tool which pr produces a bespoke solicitor written, written version. Over 3,000 written contracts have been created using the EEA contract creator. The EEA has only existed for four years and already we've helped thousands of employers to manage their business legally and sustainably. There has to be a cultural shift, and urgently, because without one, the yards who are not like the owners are draining our pool of passionate and capable future grooms. So the, to, to the solutions. Sorry, but service charges must increase. The National Minimum Wage Survey highlighted that prices must rise and keeping horses will become more expensive, especially in the competition sectors, where a groom is often working a 60-hour week or more. Yards need to become more business-focused. Whilst there are employers that adhere to good employment and are viable, 
There are others who sadly don't. They cannot continue to trade, leaning on their workforce to prop up their business by working below the legal minimum and by using false self-employment to avoid tax, national insurance, pension and employer's liability insurance requirements. We need to modernise the working day to be affordable. Viability includes the affordability of the workforce and as a sector I believe we need to modernise our practices to become viable. For example, do all staff really need to be on the yard six days a week at 7am to feed or can a rotor system be created? How can a more fle flexible approach without compromising the welfare of the horses bring down the wage bill? Perhaps it's time to accept that the things we did in the past are no longer affordable. Continued education about employment rights and responsibilities is key, and it's all of our responsibility to share it. And we need to be creative in our recruitment. Think outside the box. The return to work mum is a great example. We need to offer employment opportunities that are attractive. And let's ask ourselves, does it really matter if the horses are mucked out between school hours instead of the traditional 7 till 9 a.m.? And we must continue to modernise to retain our employees by becoming an industry of good employment. We need employers to accept that it's their responsibility to employ by the laws of the land. Over the past 15 years, the industry has taken big steps forward. However, sadly, we still have a long way to go. The key to a sustainable workforce is good employment, which can be achieved e easily through correct business management. The industry offers so many amazing opportunities, and together we have the ability to shape the future. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. <laughs> Either or. Thank you very much, Lucy. That was great and reinforcing all of the messages I think we've heard before. And we've made some progress in the last 20 years, which is also nice to hear as well, but lots more to do. So let's just hear now from Linda Greening. Come and join us, Linda. It's great to see you. Linda is Head of Inclusivity, Inclusivity at Hartbury University and is all about increasing diversity uh, it, within the uh, university. So over to you. Thank you very much, James. Is my microphone working? Fantastic. Yes. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, everybody in between and either side, hello. My name is Linda Greening. I'm the Head of Inclusivity at Harpery today. And I'm here today, sorry, to talk to you about the parallels that we are experiencing potentially in recruitment and retention between the university land-based sector and uh, the workforce in the um, industry. So I'm going to make a start by just highlighting how we're going to run. <laughs> I'm going to talk briefly around diversity as it exists in the industry currently. I'm going to get us to think gently about what's coming over the bow in terms of the future and then offer some ideas on how universities are helping um, students from diverse backgrounds, non-traditional backgrounds in university land-based sector um, transition and succeed in higher education. So to start with then, we must acknowledge that um, we are proud of our gender equality and in our sports we have um, the opportunity for male and female competitors to um, have opportunity to compete against each other on the same level and platform. And we have a thriving LGBTQ plus community um, which is receiving ever increasing support, recognition and representation. The FEI was one of the first international federations to govern and regulate a sport for both non-disabled and disabled equestrian athletes alongside the Riding for the Disabled Association, uh, which provides opportunities to ride for people with developmental and physical disabilities. We must recognise the work of our inner city riding organisations, such as St James's City Farm, Ebony Horse Club and the Urban Equestrian Academy, which aim to encourage children and young people from inner city and diverse ethnic backgrounds to interact and understand horses. We have to recognise our key riding role models uh, within, uh, with ethnically diverse backgrounds, including Lydia Hayward, Danny Morgan, Khadija Malar, and Amila Aswat, to name but a few. However, safe spaces are still needed, they're still necessary in our um, industry, and they're offered by the Bain Equine and Rural Activities Focus Group, um, which provides education and safe space opportunity for ethnically diverse equestrians to share their experiences. We must also recognise, for example, the work of riders' minds, as there are people in the industry who are still experiencing microaggressions. 
So for example, frequently in the past, I've heard members of our industry say that they do not see colour. But being colourblind is also being ignorant to the specific needs of people of colour. And ignoring racism is not the same as taking an anti-racism stance. The industry has now a really valid opportunity to actively educate itself and become allies and active bystanders and avoid the major factor preventing people enjoying the benefits of relationship with a horse being the fact that they do not feel welcome. And look into the future. We have to remember that we're in the digital age now. This is the fourth industrial tech, uh, revolution. Young people are growing up in a life of convenience and technology, and they are prioritizing indoors more than outdoors, so we need to make that more attractive. Less people are going out outside. More people are engaging with technology rather than reading books now. And we recognize that still every day we can't assume that everybody has access to digital technology. There is digital poverty where people um, will not benefit from um, access to digital technology 24 seven, um, let alone every day. We also recognize that digital technology within the household is being um, prioritized over daily essentials. So still Generation Z, born after 1995, they tend to be digitally native they're way more um, networked than we've ever been, and they are fast decision makers with a shorter concentration span, which we've recognized in um, higher education. And that means that we need to help them transition into a different way of thinking and develop skills in that sense. Um, they also seem to have more innovative ways of thinking than we ever have. Having lived now through a pandemic and thinking about traditional timeframes, they recognize that scheduling of lectures, for example, a hybrid approach, recording lectures, everything is becoming different um, and better in a way, as we recognized in the 30-year um, speech previously. They're also um, more ethnic, ethic, sorry, ethically aware, um, thinking about how things can be different from the generations that came before them. And I guess we've got an opportunity as an industry to promote positive equine welfare in terms of social license to operate. And we can also start to think about the sustainable things that we're doing and promote those to the generation that's coming over the bow. And we can't forget, of course, that we've got artificial intelligence, automation, and the centrality of algorithms. I mean, for example, I don't think I'm ever going to get on a real horse again after riding our a mechanical horse, Margaret. She's amazing. But, okay, so with all that in mind, then, we've had a little think about diversity there. Um, higher education is um, bound by, obviously, its civic duty, but also by legislation, and that's beyond the Equality Act. So all higher education providers are required to set out their objectives relating to the promotion of equality of opportunity beyond the Equality Act in relation to the full student journey, access through to progression, thinking about parity of experience, specifically with students from underrepresented groups. And in a recent piece of research um, investigating barriers to, sorry, to diversifying student populations at small specialist higher education providers, these four themes popped up. So the region or um, the rural location of the institution, the specialisms, and also um, resourcing outreach, getting out to talk about the degrees that we offer um, alongside representation, representation, both in our allied industries, um, but also on our campuses. And the chapter specifically explored reasons why land-based higher education providers struggled to attract students from ethnically diverse backgrounds. And historically, providers claimed that their campuses were reflective of the industries that they served. But our industry is not predominantly white because people from diverse ethnic backgrounds are not interested in horses. So a number of um, land-based institutions got together in collaboration with um, the BAME Equine and Rural Activities Focus Group to think about how we might be able to access our local regional community groups and raise awareness of land-based degree opportunities and career paths, essentially opening our campuses up to groups that had not previously seen what was on offer and really drive that awareness and aspiration around what they could achieve beyond maybe traditionally what they had been aware of in terms of education. Um, so yes, you can see all of the collaborative um, members on the board, on the sorry, slide here. Um, I'd also highlight that during outreach activities where we talk about what we do and what students can do potentially and in terms of careers, we also talk uh, through myth busting, so you don't have to have a horse to do an equine degree course, for example. Um, and we also talk about the, 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 the nitty gritty of finance, and we myth bust in and around that as well. And most institutions provide bursaries, grants, and loans for students from eligible backgrounds, specifically underrepresented areas. And I must highlight the good work of Royal Agricultural University in terms of their recent Ethnic Minority Excellence Scholarship. 
a really good example of positive action. Ah, the importance of representation cannot be underestimated. We really do need to be able to make sure that people from diverse backgrounds can identify with the industry and feel welcome once they get there. So we'll move on to thinking about feeling welcome when they get there before we um, finish, talking about, uh, we'll finish talking about representation. We must remember that we can't take a tokenistic approach to representation and we need to work with the people who are being um, publicised, I guess, um, to make sure that they are comfortable and confident with that. And in terms of um, considering diversity within our audiences, a number of institutions are moving away from the acronym BAME now. Um, they've started to think about not just parents in their literature, uh, we're also massively considering the use of pronouns and also gender options on a number of our different forms. So the belonging aspect, that not superficial welcome, we need to be able to make sure that we listen to the needs of the people who are coming to us from more diverse backgrounds. And in order to do that, we have looked at our campuses, the physicality of our campuses, to make sure that there are things there that cater for the needs of the people. And there are some examples there on the slide for you. Within the classroom, we're now trying to encourage um, shared experiences, so it's not just one approach from one person who's the sage in the room effectively we can all learn from each other a number of institutions are talking about decolonizing their curriculum um, and we're also trying to encourage staff development to address things like white fragility microaggressions and unconscious bias so that staff are confident in talking about these things and i must recognize the work of thebe um, with the british veterinary association here that created resources around microaggression as part of their recent good work campaign so, this is my favourite picture of all time because it helps us see what <coughs> equality is, what equity is and what inclusivity is. Essentially, we don't want to be proactive, we don't want to be reactive, we just want to remove barriers so that everybody can benefit from um, working with horses. And there are opportunities to be able to do that. We've heard about all types of collaboration today, so I encourage industry to get in touch with their local colleges and universities to investigate what opportunities exist there in terms of maybe workforces. Um, and I think we need to work to increase the visibility of opportunity beyond maybe the traditional um, uh, stereotyped approach to equine that we have in the past and listen to the needs of those who engage. So thank you very much for listening. Linda, thank you very much indeed. I love that last slide. It's, it's so uh, powerful, isn't it, for us all? Great. Um, a great number of things that you gave us there for food for thought. We've got a good number of questions coming in. I encourage more um, uh, for our panel here, uh, and I'm, hopefully we are going to be on time as well, So, which is always good to get some questions as well. So um, Zoe Elliott now joins us. Uh, Zoe is the head of careers marketing and recruitment at the British Horse Racing Authority and is really going to talk to us about attracting and uh, retaining racing talent. Over to you. Thank you, James. Your Royal Highness, ladies and gentlemen, racing continues to find uh, recruitment and retention of skilled staff challenging. For many racehorse trainers and studs, particularly around our training centres, such as Newmarket and Lambourne, at times this can be felt very acutely. We also see a higher than desirable turnover of staff and, of course, want to do better at retaining skilled staff in their jobs for longer. However, with encouraging recruitment levels of new staff into our industry each year, we are maintaining a relatively consistent size of workforce in line with the number of horses. Our training providers, notably the National Horse Racing College in Doncaster, the British Racing School and National Stud in Newmarket, all have a strong interest in their courses, often operating waiting lists of young people keen to get started on their journey into racing. We have also created an exciting new training format in Scotland with the newly created Scottish Racing Academy. So we have many reasons to feel optimistic about our future workforce, but this is certainly no time for complacency and the people agenda remains one of the most critical strategic areas of the British Horse Racing Authority as the governing body of the sport. It was about 15 years ago that racing began its concerted focus on its workforce. A study into the issues around low stable staff numbers was carried out by the BHA, initially led by Lord Donoghue and then taken forward into its second phase by Baroness Maladew. 
with a committee-based approach and the leadership of the BHA, they brought together all the key stakeholders to consider the challenges and solutions required. As you can see, this multi-agency approach means we've been able to focus on the core elements of recruitment, training and development, and retention of staff. And we are incredibly lucky to have funding from the Horse Race Betting Levy Board and the Racing Foundation. So I'd like to take you on a whistle-stop tour of the key elements of our programs. And firstly, recruitment. Some of you may already be familiar with the brand Careers in Racing. This was set up by the BHA on behalf of the whole industry, and it provides a huge library of information on the career opportunities in horse racing, covering everything from stable staff to roles on race courses. The website includes a job board completely free to use for both employer and job seeker, and is now established as the place to look for a job in horse racing. Last year, we advertised over 2,000 <coughs> jobs and have on average 178 jobs live at any one time, and they will be a mixture of stable staff jobs and race course administrative jobs, etc. Job seekers registering on the site rose by 7% in 2021, and the site traffic rose by 19% overall. So these are encouraging levels of growth and interest in our sector. We run an extensive market campaign, which takes in social media all the way to attending recruitment events. Just this week, we will have attended careers fairs at Sparshalt College, Hartbury College, and one of the national apprenticeship shows attended by thousands of school children. Using education partners that deliver career information into schools, we can spread the message about working with uh, racehorses further than ever before. We align to the national career strategy and the Gatsby benchmarks on good careers education that encourage schools to seek real-life exposure to industry and local employers. We also work closely with the Department for Work and Pensions, community groups, inner city farms and charities to take the opportunities in racing into more diverse communities. This partnership approach is proving very successful with things like the um, work we're doing between careers in racing, racing to school, the Pony Racing Authority and the Pony Club where we're all working together on a programme of activity to give more opportunities to young people to be exposed to horse racing, and especially those that don't own their own pony. And of course, our activities are not confined to young people. We also to look to support those that be, might, might be making a transition out of another career. An example of that is the work that we do with High Ground, a small charity that provides careers information on rural jobs to people leaving the military service, either as at a retiral point or due to injury. There's always considerable interest in the non-riding roles that racing can offer in rural settings, such as working on stud farms, gardening, or grounds maintenance. So in summary, our recruitment approach is multi-channel from a marketing sense, partnership focused, and aligned to government strategy and thinking on careers education. Next, I will summarise our work on training and development. Horse welfare is hugely important to the racing industry, as is staff welfare. These two things go hand in hand. We need skilled staff to provide the highest welfare to, to our horses, and we know that skilled staff will be happier, more fulfilled, and indeed safer in the working environment around horses. And it is for this reason that the racing industry focuses on providing through career learning opportunities. From starting with foundation training all the way through to online training and regionalised workplace training and development, we deliver over 50,000 people training days per annum. I'd like to focus briefly on the foundation training. This typically involves any person under the age of 19 being required to go to one of the racing schools for 9 to 12 weeks. This is an intensive period of training with daily riding, yard work and classroom education. Learners are also required to undertake regular fitness training to develop their own personal fitness and strength. And that's all part of being sort of robust to go into that very physical workplace. If they are successful in this course, they will then go on to a work placement to complete their racing groom apprenticeship over a period of up to 18 months with support throughout from workplace instructors. 
What is key and vital is the focus is very much on preparing for them for the job that they will be doing and then progressing their learning whilst they're in that job. Over 350 people enter the industry every year via this route. The foundation training pathway is still not perfect and we do find sometimes retention of learners can be challenging. And this is really where we need to work in partnership with employers to ensure that those that we invest in remain in the industry. So again, just as with recruitment, a partnership approach is key to success. And finally, I would like to speak about our retention. Whilst it may no longer be realistic to see someone stay and work in one job role or one industry for the whole of their lifetime, we are, of course, focused on retaining those that we train and ensuring that they do come into our industry and have a good experience, are employed correctly with good support services and career opportunities. Firstly, we are different in the fact that we, are, that we license all of our yards. Wages and terms are negotiated between the National Association of Racing Staff and the National Trainers Federation, and all racing staff can have the support of the union if they are concerned about any aspect of their employment. In a similar vein, our safeguarding team has grown in recent years as we strive for a safe working environment and to ensure that a culture of respect is developed throughout all of our businesses. With the support of the incredible charity Racing Welfare, staff can, staff can access advice on things from finance to occupational health, mental health support and career coaching. Offices are spread throughout the country and welfare officers always on hand. For many years, the industry has been working hard to recognise the incredible skill and dedication of stable staff through the Stud and Stable Staff Awards, Racing Staff Week, and most recently, the Leadership and Team Champion Awards, which recognises and celebrates some of the exceptional workplaces that we have. Perhaps a good thought to finish on is that although we are still seen as quite a traditional sport, we have many innovative thinkers both in terms of the way we have developed our recruitment and training programs, but also in the way our employers are thinking about new ways of working in their yards, different staff rotor systems, utilising more part-time workers, perhaps those wanting to work around school hours, and really working hard to develop incredible team cultures that mean people enjoy their jobs and want to stay. Thank you for the opportunity to outline where we are presently, and I look forward to answering your questions and discussing further how we can all work together to secure a sustainable workforce to care and ensure the welfare of our much-loved equines. Thank you, Zoe. Well, thank you very much, Zoe. You've given us a great food for thought there. Um, easy to me, for me to say at lunchtime. Um, Thank you for doing so much in racing, so much we can all learn from. But I think it would be fair to say across the whole of our team here today have really given us a great insight into some of the challenges that we face, but also some of the solutions that we can offer up. I've got lots of uh, questions that have streamed through. If I could just ask the team here, when you uh, answer a question, just to lean uh, into the mic, just so everybody can catch what we're saying. And I'm just going to go and try and consolidate a couple of the questions uh, to st start with. And uh, this first one's from uh, Sophie Cookson King and Sandra Murphy on the on the uh, question of of diversity. And uh, uh, Sandra's saying uh, we we haven't got enough people uh, of diverse or ethnic minority within our sector. And I think we would absolutely all agree with that. For, certainly from a BHS perspective, we very much want to. Uh, improve that position and we recently appointed uh, a trustee for EDI uh, responsibility. But from Sophie's uh, part of the question says, how can we encourage more people into the sector and what are a couple of the easy steps that perhaps we could uh, take to do that? Uh, Linda, one for you, but then we can ask the other question. Definitely open it up. But um, I guess uh, it's about opening doors and increasing accessibility. The sense of belonging in our industry for people of colour, I think, is very low at the moment. And all that needs to happen in the first instance, I think, is to open doors and make sure that people can walk across our thresholds and then start to develop that sense of belonging once they're in. 
And that's what we're trying to do with that community outreach piece, really. Great. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Linda. Um, ben, uh, what's, what's your thought? Um, on that thought, I think we need to sort of tap into the young people that are leaving secondary school. Um, because obviously the younger generation at the moment are disengaged because of social media or the internet. When I was young, I spent every single waking hour, minute at the stables. Um, so we need to sort of maybe go into secondary schools, show them there is a career with horses, um, and maybe because not everyone is that academic, you know, in school, um, prefer the practical approach because the apprenticeship is a good foundation um, to get people into the working industry and get them employed. Great, yeah, absolutely right. And maybe there's a role there I can feel from a BHS perspective. Some of our volunteers may well be uh, able to, to, to support that as well with support from uh, folks like yourself, Ben. Um, make you even busier. <laughs> Ali, I've got a question for you, if, if I may. Um, the, uh, there's a, a question come from Hayley Williams. And Hayley asks um, that she's a, a lecturer at Equine College and she's really uh, concerned about uh, making sure that um, students are work ready, skills savvy, as she refers to it as. From, from your perspective as a proprietor and owner of a, of a big riding school, what, what's one, one uh, bit of advice you would give to make sure those students are ready to come and work for you? Um, the advice would be to do your um, training at, at a centre and get on the tool training. So if, you're, if you are college based, work with your local riding school to um, to facilitate the learning they need to be um, they need to be work ready so they can they know what the work environment entails also with um, college leavers I know the racing board are very good at fitness um, that has to be addressed it is a very hard job um, it's um, long hours and um, the level of fitness is is really important mm. and I think um, students that come in and um, other people that come into the role don't appreciate or realise um, how, how tough it is. So. So, so, I mean, it's a great point and I'm sure we've got many uh, educators here as well. I wonder if at Hartbury you've um, thought of using um, uh, PE lessons, you know, the fitness to be part of the education system. Have you ever thought of doing that, preparing people for work? I mean, it's something that comes time and time again from employers people that aren't, aren't actually work ready. There's been a lot of talk about fitness, definitely, within the industry. There's a lot of research going on, I think, around rider fitness currently. Um, and so we've got some actual evidence and some fitness regimes that would be useful, uh, that could be definitely put into place. And I think that's one of the opportunities where industry and education providers can work together to really make sure that we are providing the workforce for the future, mm. uh, bound within the, the remit yeah. of curriculum. Yeah, of course. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Great, great question. Um, Lucy, if I can turn to you as well. I've got a, a, a really um, good question here, and it was also addressed slightly by Zoe, but from your perspective, you talked about um, changing hours. And Leanne Pershaw asks us, um, is it possible really to look at more flexible work schedules, and um, could that be something that uh, could be introduced more into uh, the working week? Do you think employers are going to be able to, to really do that? Is that possible? Uh, if they can't afford the wage bill, then there's going to have to be some change within the way that they operate. Um, otherwise, the business is not viable, and therefore, what's the future of the business, sadly? And that's my, that's my big concern. So I think that's what I'm saying about I think we have to look at the way that when I was a groom and, and the things that I had to do and the, and the rigid structure. I think it exists particularly in, in, the, in the competition yards, if I'm honest. Um, everybody starts at 7 or 7.30 and everybody goes until they're done. And, and racing's a really good example of there has been flexibility. And I spoke to an employer just yesterday who's really struggling, a livery yard with a, an eventing slant to it, really struggling to find staff. And I asked her about her working day and I said, have you ever considered the return to work mum? Because I really do think that's a, a point. Um, as sort of one myself. Um, and I said, have you considered that? Well, no, that wouldn't work with my yard. And I said, well, but you've just told me you can't find staff. So does it matter if the horses are mucked out between nine and three instead of seven 
and nine. You know, can we... And I do think we... I think it's a, it's a much longer conversation than for today, but I think there is a piece there that we have to make the way that we operate Force viable. Ourselves. Force ourselves. Yeah, well, to, we to, have to, to, because otherwise yeah. you're, you can't operate if you can't afford the wage bill and all the other bills that come in. So there has to be a flexible approach. And I'm, I think this industry is getting there. So let's, let's, thank you, Lucy. Let's, let's um, hear some, a positive note here from uh, Laura Cackett, who says, I'm often overrun with applicants from college leavers, and they all profess to be struggling to find roles in the sector. Well, we would all certainly like to hear from them, and perhaps um, the BHS can help you. Please email me afterwards, uh, Laura, and we'll, we'll try to facilitate that, because we know hundreds of riding schools that are in desperate need of those uh, great candidates. So please, please do send them our way. So I want to turn, uh, Zoe, to yourself, if I can. Um, you've, you do so much work uh, out in, in the community, um, but do you think there is more that um, technical colleges and FE can do to support uh, the racing industry, for, for example? Is there anything that's going on? Yeah, I mean, I think it's evident. We, we spend a lot of time going around the equine colleges to ensure that they're aware of the career routes because they don't really cover... Just pull your mic, just in case, just swing yeah. it, that's it, that's it. They, they, the equine colleges <coughs> don't particularly cover horse racing. Um, so we spend quite a lot of time making sure at least they understand the, the career pathway. Um, yes, it's about working with them, getting them to see what the opportunities are. We've also developed a summer program um, which currently takes place at the British Racing School and that's uh, specifically for people leaving an equine college, again, to give them six weeks of intensive riding and development to make them, you know, in a good place to go then into a racing yard. So. skill savvy, job ready, ready to be, be really productive as yeah, soon as they start. Yeah, because the yard uh, learning environment at the racing schools, they are run in the way a racing yard is run to, to similar sort of yeah. uh, time frames yeah. and, and speed of work required. Brilliant. Great, thank you very much for that. We've got time just for one more uh, question. And I'd like, Ali, if you would uh, um, answer the, the last one for us, if you can. Changing the subject, there's been some talk of technology uh, throughout the morning. But yeah. from a riding school perspective, and, and Lucy's talked about it, you feel it every day. I know when we've discussed it, it is about trying to become more efficient. Is there, is there room for technology in a riding school, in booking systems, or in...? Uh, it's Quite funny, my father used to, well, he used to say that the future of riding schools is virtual reality, horses. Um, and the price of horses currently, um, it's probably uh, on par with the, the staffing problem that we've got. It's a massive problem for the riding school industry. Um, but that aside, uh, with regards to technology, um, we have recently come online with an online booking system. Um, and we... It, it, it is working for our business. It's great that you have your app and the clients can book when they choose throughout the night, 24-7. Um, but it, is, it does have its challenges. Um, I think trying to put technology and be that prescriptive into riding and lessons, uh, it, it, it has its challenges. But, you know, it's, it's a start. Still in its early days. Yeah, early, days, early days. Yeah, We're looking yeah. for investors yeah. to help us become more in, in, uh, in, in efficient. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, it's been a fascinating uh, discussion. Uh, it's one that's certainly challenging all of us across our sector. Some of those key themes that we've had, firstly, that most uh, worrying one is that riding schools are under, under threat, that Ali talked to us, and we must do something about that as 80% of us learn to ride uh, at schools. We know under-representation uh, is a big issue, and we have to work harder as a sector about doing that, so some great advice for that. Good employment, I heard that many times. We use the same acronyms our, ourselves at the British Horse Society is, is fundamental and summarizes many of the great practices. And, and Ben and Ali, it's about how do we encourage people and really, again, bring people through. Once we can uh, keep people in our, in our businesses, then they tend to stay if we give them the opportunities and try and uh, offer those different uh, ways of working. So just before we now close this session, uh, we have uh, just a, a little clip from 
Summerfield Riding School. Summerfield Riding School is just outside um, Birmingham near Yardley and is very much focused on giving inner city ch uh, children and young people the opportunity to ride and enter their career in equestrianism. I have to say, everybody, just before uh, you, you complain that you can't hear this very well, all of our great uh, folks that are about to speak were being filmed in, um, the, in the big storms last weekend. So you'll see how tough they are. Let's, uh, perhaps we can run, run that film. I'm, I'm really excited to the career in the equine industry as watching people achieve and progress towards their goals really gives me quite a big sense of achievement and that's why I'd like to go into instructing. So I'm excited to work in the equine industry because it's always been a dream of mine to work with horses. Also being outside, especially when it's summer, I mean it's not now, but in the summertime it is amazing to work with horses. It just gives you a thrill, it's lovely. I'm really excited to work with the FL industry because I love being hands on with the animals and building relationships with them. Okay. I love working with horses because of the, the kind of life skills that it's given me. I feel like I've completely grown and changed as a person because of like the, the responsibility that it gives me. So I'm very grateful for that. I see a bright future ahead in the equestrian industry as a stud rider because of the support and the great start that Summerfield Stables has given me. There we go, ladies and gentlemen. There's our bright future for our sector. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.